I'm delighted to be with you again to discuss the second in a series of four lessons on the subject of evolution and special creation. This lesson is entitled, Why the Theory of Evolution Has Not Been Proven. This whole topic is of interest to people who are concerned about who they are, what is the nature of human life, what's the purpose of life, and what, after all, is it all about? This is the second in the series, and the lesson is titled, Why the Theory of Evolution Has Not Been Proven. I think it would be well for us to, again, consider some texts of Scripture that point the believer in the Bible to the fact that the universe that we're living in is the result of what God has done. I hope tonight to be talking about something that you will all see as important. I don't believe in mountain climbing over molehills, do you? And we want to be very direct and clear and open in everything that we have to say. There are several passages of Scripture that suggest to me the very things that we're talking about tonight. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.26 and 27 where it speaks of God saying, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And then male and female created he them. Genesis 2.7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. And then again in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And then the 19th Psalm, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. And then in two remarkable texts that's in the same chapter, Jeremiah 32, 17 and 27. In the first verse, verse 17, God said, is anything too hard for me? And then in verse 27, the prophet says, is anything too hard for thee? We believe that the only way to explain the immensity and the beauty and the complexity of the universe around us is with the concept of God. That without God, it's impossible to explain it. There's evidence of intelligence everywhere in the universe. We believe that. And we hope to sustain that idea by what we're going to be saying here. Turning back to the Genesis account for just a moment, let me remind you, of a threefold nature of this account. It's characterized by brevity. Only 457 words in the Hebrew to tell about the beginning of the entire universe, the origin of life, and the special creation of man. A remarkable brevity. And secondly, simplicity. Most people who understand the sciences understand that all of the laws of science are usually stated in simple terms. And whenever people have to make it more elaborate and more complex, you can see that a particular law or position in science is about to be replaced with another. Simplicity does not mean superficiality. The Genesis account is characterized by simplicity. And thirdly, by dignity. Because it tells us that there is mind in the universe. And particularly with regard to man, man is the product of the purposeful creative acts of God and that man has about him a nature which is like the maker of the universe. And that certainly suggests to us that which would raise a sense of dignity in the mind of any thinking person. So of course in this series of studies we'll be trying to answer the question what is man? The Bible answers that very clearly. The Bible says that man is made up of material things, his flesh, it is physical, it's temporal. It is subject to death. But also the Bible says that there is a spirit in man. Daniel 7 verse 15. Job chapter 32 and verse 8 says there is a spirit in man. And the inspiration of the Almighty giveth it understanding. Daniel said, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body. And on and on in the Bible we'll have a picture of a twofold being. The Bible then says that man is not simply a highly developed animal. He's not just one species among many. He's distinct. The Bible says that he's made a little lower than the angels, but he's certainly above the animals. And any discussion like this, what we ask people to do is to look at the universe and look at certain facts and then ask, what's the most reasonable explanation of these facts? Some facts to consider. Number one, the universe exists. Now, sometimes you'll meet people who say, how do you know we're really here? Well, if we can't accept that, we ought to all go out and have coffee or a Coke or something and forget discussions. But if we accept the fact that we're here, the universe exists, then what are the choices? Something came from nothing? 
or something always was. And what is that? Is it matter? Is it mind? We're going to suggest to you in just a few moments that the best information we have now scientifically is the universe had a beginning. It has not always been here. So people no longer have the, uh, the comfort of infinite regress where you can just go back, cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect forever. Fact number two, the universe shows signs of design and purpose. Well, what are the choices? Blind chance or divine planning? In fact, number three, man possesses a unique nature. Man is different than the lower animals. He's like them in many ways, but he's different too. And how do you account for that? Is this the product of evolution or is it the result of divine creation? These are the kind of questions that we'll be asking and hopefully we'll be speaking clearly in a way that all can understand and make an evaluation. I believe that my work in a series like this is somewhat like the task of a lawyer in a courtroom. You cannot expect a jury that's going to make a decision about some, some case before it to take graduate courses in biology and in chemistry and geology and engineering in order to understand the testimony that's presented. And the task, it seems to me like, for me and someone in my role is to take a step toward the jury, toward those who will look and listen and present the kind of evidence that's put in such a clear way that people can make some value judgments with regard to it and draw some conclusions. And that's exactly what we hope to do. I don't want to be like the boy who came home from college and he had one semester under his belt and he wanted to impress his father who was a farmer. He wanted to impress him with the the fact that uh, he had a real and large vocabulary, he often heard his father say, don't count your chickens before the hatch, but this college freshman stepped up to his father when he returned home on a vacation and said, don't calculate your juvenile poultry until the proper period of incubation is materialized. I'm not here to talk over anybody's head, but we want to talk about things that will be helpful and profitable to us. And we're not here to cram anything down anybody's throat. I'm not so stupid as to think that I could do that. I remember one time speaking to a high school class on this very subject in Topeka, Kansas, and they put me in the faculty lounge before they turned me loose on the students. And I was looking around the room and I saw a bulletin board. And it had a little poster and it had this exhortation, obviously, directed toward the faculty. The poster read, know your stuff, know whom you're stuffing, stuff them. <laughs> We're not here to stuff anybody. But we, here, we are here to look at some things that we think will be helpful in weighing this matter and deciding what seems to be the most reasonable explanation of the world in which we're living. I want to turn now to an interview that took place a number of years ago. I think it was in 1978. And it appeared in the New York Times magazine. It was an interview with Robert Jastrow, who is the director of NASA's Goddard Institute. And this astronomer was talking about the recent developments that have intrigued him and everyone else. Let me share a little bit of this article with you. When an astronomer writes about God, his colleagues assume that he's either over the hill or going bonkers. In my case, it should be understood that from the start, I am an agnostic in religious matters. However, I'm fascinated by some strange developments going on in astronomy partly because of their religious implications and partly because of the peculiar reaction of my colleagues. The essence of the strange developments is that the universe had, in some sense, a beginning. That it began at a certain moment in time and under circumstances that seemed to make it impossible, not just now, but ever, to find out what force or forces brought the world into being at that moment. Was the creative agent one of the familiar forces of physics, or was it, as the Bible says, that all-powerful hand that creates the world out of formless matter? He's discussing the fact that the God question has been raised again, and this is upsetting to people. He said that theologians generally are delighted with the proof that the universe had a beginning, but astronomers are curiously upset. The reactions provide an interesting demonstration of the response of the scientific mind, supposedly a very objective mind, when evidence, he says, uncovered by science, itself leads to a conflict with the articles of faith in our profession. It turns out that the scientist behaves the way the rest of us do when our beliefs are in conflict with the evidence. We become irritated, we pretend the conflict does not exist, and we paper it over with meaningless 
phrases. And in the article, uh, this quotation is found, the scientist behaves the way the rest of us do. When our beliefs are in conflict with the evidence. He's talking about the strange development where we're having to deal with the God question. We may not like to do that, but we're having to do it. Notice, in the article, he points out that the second law of thermodynamics indicates that the universe is running down like a clock. If it is running down, there must have been a time when it was fully wound up. He's trying to explain the attitude of fellow scientists as they confront this evidence that the universe had a beginning. And he says, I think part of the answer is that the scientist cannot bear the thought of a natural phenomenon that cannot be explained even with unlimited time and money. There's a kind of religion in science. It is the religion of a person who believes there is order and harmony in the universe and every event can be explained in a rational way as the product of some previous event. Every effect must have its cause. Einstein wrote, the scientist is possessed by the sense of universal causation. This religious faith of the scientist is violated by the discovery that the world had a beginning under conditions in which the known laws of physics are not valid and as a product of forces or circumstances we cannot discover. When that happens, the scientist has lost control. If he really examined the implications, he would be traumatized. As usual, when faced with trauma, the mind reacts by ignoring the implications. In science, this is known as refusing to speculate or trivializing the origin of the world by calling it a big bang as if the universe were a firecracker. He says, this is an exceedingly strange development, unexpected by all but the theologians. They have always accepted the word of the Bible, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, to which Augustine added, who can understand this mystery or explain it to others? But we scientists did not expect to find evidence for an abrupt beginning because we have had until recently such extraordinary success in tracing the chain of cause and effect backward in time. We've been able to connect the appearance of man on this planet to the crossing of the threshold of life, the manufacturing of chemical ingredients of life within stars that have long since expired, the formation of those stars out of primal mist and the expansion of cooling apparent clouds of gases out of cosmic fireballs. Now we would like to pursue that inquiry further back in time, but the barrier to progress seems insurmountable. It is not a matter of another year, another decade of work, another measurement, or another theory. At this moment, it seems as though science will never be able to raise the curtain on the mystery of creation. For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. And as he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. The evidence that the universe had a beginning raises all over again to many people who had abandoned it, the concept, the idea of God. No way to avoid it. And tonight, as we talk about the theory of evolution and why it has not been proven, I hope again at the very beginning to, to define the terms that are using so you'll know exactly what I'm talking about and what I'm not talking about. And in that sense, I'm going to have to do a little bit of reviewing. I tell people that I don't believe in preaching Jericho sermons. That's when you march around the same point seven times and shout. But sometimes you have to do a little reviewing. And so let me review with you what we had in a previous lesson discussed. We talked about the importance of the issue as we have tonight. And we gave a definition of terms so that we will not misunderstand what we are talking about. We tried to make a clear distinction between the special and general theories of evolution and that we will do again tonight. And we made the point that to establish on the basis of clearly provable and observable evidence, one, that is the theory, the special theory, does not mean that you have thereby established or proven the other. The attempts that are being made today to prove the theory of evolution the evidence that proves anything does not prove the general theory of evolution, but it proves the special theory. Let me go back and notice that again as we define our terms. The special theory can be called microevolution. And that simply refers to changes within groups of living things. Let's look at this diagram so that we can reinforce that again. 
The special theory is that you can observe changes within groups of living things. This is observable and provable and it's going on all the time. And that is not in conflict with the Genesis account of creation. The Bible talks about how God created living things to bring forth after their kind. The word kind, which is the Hebrew word mean, M-I-N, is ten times in the Genesis account. The Bible teaches fixity of kind. We want to add the Bible does not teach fixity of species. If you mean by species the ability to mate and produce offspring, there are changes going on all the time in the realm of living things. And some creatures change enough. It's not a great change, but it's enough so that when they're separated from one another and they change by combination recombination genes and they're brought back together, they won't mate. Slight variations take place like this in a number of different populations. And in that sense, in that limited sense of species and the definition of species, the ability to produce mate and produce offspring, new species arise. The Bible doesn't teach fixity of species, it teaches fixity of kind. It talks about groups of living things within which, as these whirly gig lines would indicate, that there are changes within the groups. But what the Bible does not teach and what the evidence that we're going to look at tonight and the other evenings does not support is the theory, the general theory. The evidence in the, in the study of sciences and also the teaching in the Bible does not allow us to conclude that one major group of animals has developed into another, into another, into another. And as we're talking about what we mean by this, let me just read again the statement that I referred to last night, and I'll be coming back in just a few moments to this important book. This is from the book, Implications of Evolution by G.A. Kirkut, who was the general editor of, in an international series of uh, monographs on pure and applied biology, he was the general editor of the zoology section. And he says there's a theory which states that many living animals can be observed over the course of time to undergo changes so that new species are formed. And this can be called the special theory of evolution and can be demonstrated in certain cases by experiments. We can look at the finch, the finches that are on the island, the Galapagos Islands. And these finches are the result of changes, slight changes and variations by combination and recombination of genes so that when the population came, came back together, they were not able to mate. So you have a lot of different species of finches. There have been changes within this group called finches. And what does that sustain? That sustains the concept of the special theory. That's this idea here. Changes within groups. But Kirk goes on to remind us that on the other hand, there's a theory that all living forms in the world have arisen from a single source which itself came from an inorganic form. And then he goes on and says that the evidence that supports this is not sufficiently strong to call it anything more than a working hypothesis. This is the general theory of evolution. This is a depiction of it that uh, life began spontaneously. Life came from the non-living, it happened only one time, and that all living things, extant and extinct, are interrelated by process of development. So that this is supposed to depict a development from marine life to amphibian to reptiles to birds to mammals and finding man. This is the general theory of evolution. The general theory of evolution is to be clearly distinguished from the special, the special theory. In the special theory, there are changes within groups. In the general theory, there's a development from one major group into another into another. So that what they're really arguing is that all living things are interrelated as a result of this process. And that's what we're here really discussing, and that's what we're really opposing as we talk about the theory of evolution and special creation. Now, the reason why we need to spend time and clearly define what we're talking about is that we do not want to be put in a position of arguing what we're not arguing. Let me suggest to you the following facts that are important to illustrate what I mean. All of the major proofs that are offered in the textbooks, over and over again, these are put in the textbooks. You see the diagrams, few comments. But the major proofs simply prove changes within groups, changes that sustain the concept of the special theory. In other words, the so-called phylogeny of the horse. We do not have any phylogenies, folks. We'll be talking about that in a bit. But this idea of claiming we've got all these family histories, they don't exist. I'm not just saying that. I'm going to show you abundant evidence of that. But even if we could say that we had really a family history of the horse, all this would show would be a changes within a group. And all that would sustain is the special theory. 
The phylogeny of the horse, if it existed, does not prove the general theory of evolution. That is, that one major group developed another and another. All it would prove would be change and development within a single group. Or as we refer to Darwin's finches, they're just simply a classic example of the same thing. You might change size and coloration and beaks. Maybe a lot of different things about these finches, but fundamentally, you have not had a major change. This is a change within a group. But what we're looking for is how one major group develops into another so that all of them are interrelated as a process or result of the process of development. And a final example of that is Drosophila, the fruit fly. All of those things simply illustrate the fact that all of the evidence that is argued in the textbooks is the kind of evidence to sustain the conclusion that there are limited changes or the special theory. What we're arguing against is not the special theory that there are changes within groups. We're arguing against the general theory which claims that one group of animals is developed into another into another. The Bible teaches fixity of kind. It does not teach fixity of species. An example of that, you can go to Leviticus chapter 11 and verse 16, and it speaks about hawks after their kind. Hawks are a super family in modern classification or taxonomy. The point I want to make is that what we are and what we are not arguing against. Having defined our terms in such a way that we know where we're going, let's look again. The special theory changes within a group. The general theory changes from one major group into another group. We're here tonight to make the argument that the evidence does not prove the theory of evolution. Why the theory of evolution has not been proven. Now, I want to go back now to the book by Kirkut that I mentioned just a little bit ago. Let me first of all maybe in a little more complete way, identify who I'm talking about when I'm talking about Kirkut and his book. This is a valuable book, not only because of the credentials of the man, but because of the fairness and the frankness with which he writes. Kirkut's book, The Implications of Evolution, part of an international series of monographs on pure and applied biology. He was the general editor of the zoology division. He was professor in the Department of Physiology and Biochemistry at the University of Southampton in England. Now what I want to do in this book, I want you to take you inside the covers of the book. And tonight I want to begin by taking you to an interview that Kirkcutt would have with an undergraduate student in biology. This is very revealing. Listen now with me as we listen to the exchange between a student and this professor in a university in England. He says, for some years now I have tutored undergraduates on the various aspects of biology, and it's quite common, he says, during the course of the conversation to ask the student if he knows the evidence for evolution. This usually evokes a faintly superior smile at the simplicity of the questions, question, since it is an old war horse set in countless examinations. Well, sir, there's the evidence from paleontology, Comparative anatomy, embryology, systematics, geographical distributions, the student will say in a nursery rhyme jargon, sometimes even ticking off the words on his fingers. And then he would sit and look fairly complacent and wait for a more difficult question. To follow such is the nature of the evidence for natural selection. Instead, I would continue on with evolution. Do you think that the evolutionary theory is the best explanation yet advanced to explain animal interrelationships, I would ask? Well, of course, would be the reply in some amazement to my question. There's nothing except for the religious explanation held by some fundamentalist Christians. And I gather, sir, that these views are no longer held by the more up-to-date churchmen. You see, right here, you're seeing what a lot of people think. They think the only argument against evolution is a religious one. And that's what this student was saying. And Kirkcutt begins to show him that he hadn't thought through this thing too clearly. The argument against evolution is not just a religious argument. Now that's what the discussion of the public schools, they would like to make you think that. And when someone's opposing evolution and proposing the concept of creationism, they say we want to slip religion in the public schools and you know the people are buying that. But it's deceptive. Because there are scientific arguments against the theory of evolution we propose to show them tonight. But let's go further. So, I would continue, you believe in evolution because there's no other theory. 
Oh, no, sir. I believe in it because of the evidence I just mentioned. Well, have you ever read any book on the evidence for evolution, I would ask? Yes, sir. And here he would mention the names of the author of a popular school textbook. And of course, sir, there is that book by Darwin, The Origin of Species. Have you read this book, I ask? Well, not all through, sir. About how much? The first part, sir. Yeah, the first 50 pages, yes, sir, about that much, maybe a little bit less. And I see that that has given you your firm understanding of evolution. I was showing you last night that even professors have not read Darwin too carefully. On numerous occasions, I've had them deny that Darwin taught that men came from apes and monkeys, but you can read it for yourself on page 528 of The Descent of Man, 5, 18, 19, 20. But this student was saying, well, he'd read... Well, you're going to find out that... Uh, People say they read a thing, they read its title, you know. I see, then this has given you your firm understanding of evolution. Yes, sir. Well, if you really understand an argument, you will be able to indicate me not only the points in favor of the argument, but also the most telling points against it. I suppose so, sir. Well, good. Please tell me some of the evidence against their evolution. Against what, sir? The theory of evolution. But there isn't any, sir. Whenever I go to high schools and I meet a pretty militant high school biology teacher who doesn't want me there at all, I usually ask a question like this, did you ever in your undergraduate days or in your graduate days or since you have been a teacher, did you ever write a paper or assign a paper on the scientific arguments against the theory of evolution? And you get a, a very pained smile and response of course not, there aren't any. You know something? If you never learned any in school, you won't teach any. That's just a fact. And this is the way many people believe. They think the only argument against the theory of evolution is a biblical argument. Notice how Kirkcutt continues with the student. Here the conversation, he said, would take on a more strained atmosphere. The student would look at me as if I were playing a very unfair game. It would be clearly against the rules to ask for evidence against a theory when he'd learn up everything in favor of the theory. He would also take it rather badly when I suggest that he's not being very scientific in his outlook if he swallows the latest scientific dogma. And when questioned, just repeats parrot fashion the views of the current Archbishop of Evolution. In fact, Kirkcutt says, he would be behaving as certain of those religious students he affects to despise. He would be taking on faith what he could not intellectually understand and when questioned would appeal to the authority, the authority of a good book, which in this case is the origin of species. And then parenthetically he adds, it is interesting to note that many of these widely quoted books are read by title only. Three such that come to mind, he says, is the Bible, origin of species, and Das Kapital. I would then suggest that the student would go away and read the evidence for and against evolution and present it as an essay. A week would pass and the same student would appear armed with an essay on the evidence for evolution. And he says the essay would usually be well done since the student would have realized that I should be tough to convince. And when the essay had been read and the question concerning the evidence against evolution came up, the student would give a rather pained smile. Well, sir, I looked up various books but could not find anything in the scientific books against evolution. I did not think you want a religious argument. No, you are quite correct. I want a scientific argument against evolution. Well, sir, there does not seem to be one and that in itself is a piece of evidence in favor of the evolutionary theory. There doesn't seem to be one. At this piece of logic, the student would sit back and feel that he'd come out on top. After all, I had merely been questioning him whilst he had produced the information. I would then indicate to him that the theory of evolution was of considerable antiquity and would mention to him that he may, might have looked at the book by Radel, The History of Biological Theories, and having made sure that the student had noted the book down for future reference, I would proceed as follows. And how Dr. Kirkcutt would proceed with that student is the book that he wrote a book in which he discusses the seven, imp the seven assumptions of the general theory of evolution. Seven assumptions which have never, ever been proven. And I have taken these seven assumptions and disarmed the most adamant advocate of evolution by pressing them, have these been proven?
Kirkut talks about the basic assumptions. He says there are seven basic assumptions that are often not mentioned during discussion of evolution. Many evolutionists ignore the first six assumptions and only consider the seventh. What is an assumption? What are we talking about? When we're talking about an assumption. Well, the comedian W.C. Field said that he grew up in a town where a doctor treated a woman seven years for yellow jaundice and found out she was Japanese. That is operating under a false assumption. Listen carefully now, while Kirkut tells you the seven assumptions that undergird the general theory of evolution which have not been proven. Listen to this and listen carefully. The first assumption was that non-living things gave rise to living material, spontaneous generation. Has that been proven? Once in a while you hear somebody say, well, what about that experiment that Dr. Miller did in laboratory where we took this material and put it in a test tube and shot electricity through it and, and he got some amino acids and isn't that the building blocks of living things and so here we're off and going. I remember years ago when I lived in Louisville, Kentucky, a 16-year-old student in a high school was presented with this argument. And he said, wanting to understand what the teacher was saying, are you saying that life could come from the non-living without any outside force? And he says, yes, this experiment proves it. And the student simply said, but Dr. Miller was an outside force. Yeah, that's right, he was a thinking, intelligent outside force. Someone says, well, John, suppose someday the word flashes over the news that they have created life in a test tube. What's that going to do? Isn't that going to prove that life could come from the non-living? No, it'll be the great. You see, if, we, if we're close to doing something like that, we've been able to produce genes. We've been able to, to produce uh, enzymes. We've been able to produce uh, viruses. Enzymes, this fantastic thing that can skip over thousands of steps and instantaneously change things. We've done a lot of things. We're very close to doing something like that. But what will be the response or what should be the response when someday the world hears that we've been able to make something that's able to, by process of replication, show that it's living and we have viruses, but viruses must attach themselves to a living cell. If that day ever comes when someone talks about, you know, life in a test tube, it'll be the greatest proof that we've ever had for God. And the reason is because it will prove without a doubt that it took the collected technical skill of the whole human family to do it. When you have an experiment in which it takes an incredible amount of collected technical skill to pull someone off, something off and then say, well, that experiment will prove that it could happen accidentally. No, it proves the very opposite. And what we've done, we've taken the living model and then taken it apart and tried to put it back together again to synthesize it. Is there evidence that life came from the non-living? This is still just an assumption. It is therefore a matter of faith on the part of the biologist that biogenesis did occur and he can choose whatever method of biogenesis happens to suit him personally. The evidence for what did happen is not available. The whole theory of evolution, the general theory, is based upon the idea that life came from the unliving and we don't have any proof that that happened. The second point that he says among the seven assumptions is the second assumption is that biogenesis occurred only once. See, if you have all these living things go down, you know, down to a single tap root, that's an interesting assumption. This, again, is a matter of belief rather than proof. The simplest explanation is not always the right one, even in biology. And Crick, who was the co-discoverer of the structure of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, it's a double helix, he's never been satisfied with the idea, you know, that spontaneous generation just occurred once here in the year. Why not a dozen times? And so he's come up with this theory that, you know, that life began someplace out there and then it was brought to this earth. Why? Because it just doesn't seem to be sensible to argue that it just could happen one time. 
Well, the third general assumption that undergirds, and every time you talk about the theory of evolution, these are the basic assumptions that are inherent in it. Third assumption is that, back, that viruses, bacteria, protozoa, and the higher animals were all interrelated. That's an assumption. We have as yet no definite evidence about the way in which viruses, bacteria, or protozoa are interrelated. We don't know. And yet it's so easy on a television program to go from spontaneous generation in 10 seconds to an incredibly complex world of living things, hop, skip, and a jump. But I've noticed carefully what they say sometime when they talk about it. They say huge molecules miraculously acquired the ability to reproduce themselves. Natural process. <laughs> Built-in assumption. Well, the fourth assumption was that the protozoa gave rise to the metazoa. That is the single cell to the many cell. That sounds logical, doesn't it? Well, some people argue the exact opposite. Here again, nothing definite is known. We can believe that any one of these views is better than any other according to the relative importance that we accord to the various species of evidence. This is the kind of thing that Kirkcutt was trying to get an undergraduate student to understand, that there are clear, strong scientific arguments against the idea that we've got this thing figured out and we've explained it. No, the general theory of evolution has not been proven. This is an assumption. The fifth assumption was that the various invertebrate phyllas are interrelated. We usually think about creatures without a backbone. I have met some creatures that I didn't think had any backbone, but uh, and there are creatures that don't. But now the idea of whether or not we've been able to explain how that all happened, the evidence then for the affinities of the majority of the invertebrates is tenuous and circumstantial and not the type of evidence that would allow us to form a verdict of definite relationship. We do not know. The sixth assumption, that the invertebrates gave rise to the vertebrates, here again it is a matter of belief which way the evidence happens to point. As Barrow states, a well-known writer on this, in a sense this account is science fiction. And the seventh assumption, the seventh assumption we're in somewhat stronger ground with the seventh assumption that the fish and amphibians and reptiles and birds and mammals are interrelated, but the evidence that we have at present is insufficient to allow us to decide the answer to these problems. The idea that we fig we've got this figured out and neatly are able to show a development. Kirkcott is saying that there are seven assumptions. These are things that when people start arguing for the theory of evolution, they usually leap to the seventh one, the first. But we must not forget the rest of these assumptions. And we've got to be careful about misrepresentations. I don't want to misrepresent what anybody says, and we ought not to be misrepresenting the evidence. I heard the story about a, a Texas rancher that went up to Wall Street and was talking to some businessmen up there, and one of them said, hey, I heard last year that you, you made a million dollars in oil in Texas. And he said, well, that's pretty close to true. He said, it wasn't in Texas, it was in Oklahoma, and it wasn't in oil, it was in cattle, and I didn't make a million, but I lost. But outside of that, you got it pretty close. What we're saying here is that when people deal with the, with the general theory of evolution, they should be made aware that there are seven assumptions that undergird it which have not been proven. But let me go a step further in this tonight in what I call my general discussion of the matter of the theory of evolution. I want to challenge you to do something sometime. Anybody could do this if they would take the time and simply look at enough books. Look at the textbooks. Just collect textbooks and start asking questions about this so-called tree of living things. You saw it a while ago, the geological time scale. And I challenge you to study any organism that you want to study. You can study any animal, and I'll tell you, you are going to get quotations like those that I'm going to share with you. That I have a collection of 81 quotations. I'm going to sample some of them tonight. You could have 400, 500, 681 quotations. But I'm just going to sample for you tonight some of these quotations to show you the nature of what you'll discover if you'll read the text. Now notice this. Most textbooks are oversimplifications. The way to teach is to organize. The way to be organized is to simplify. And the tendency many times is to oversimplify. And many times textbooks are festering masses of assertions. If that is true of the textbooks, now listen 
to the statements they're making, and you're going to see that the conclusions I'm trying to draw are really conservative conclusions. Let's just look at some of the things that you can discover if you will look around and search in the textbooks. As we consider the question, has evolution been proven? Let's notice, first of all, start off with life. We do not know where life began. I'm simply going to read the quotations and here or where they're from. There are the uh, documentations, and if you'd like a copy of that, I'd be glad to provide that with you, of the whole list of 81. But let's take the protozoa, the one-celled animal. It is not known just what were the ancestors of the protozoa. You can find quotations like that. Or the metazoa, the many-celled animals. The ancestry of the metazoa is a baffling mystery. What's that saying? We don't know how life began. We don't know anything about the development of the first cell or the single cell. We don't know anything about the many cell. Let's just go on, though, and we'll go through these rather quickly. The metazoa. Mesozoa, I mean, the microscopic parasitic animals which are solid and have no digestive cavity. Since the discovery of the Mesozoans by Crone in 1839, almost every zoologist who has studied this group has interpreted differently their life cycle and the relationship to other animals. Or take the flatworms. Well, maybe we'd be more interested personally in the tapeworm. So we'll take the tapeworm. Tapeworms. We do not know what what it is, what its ancestors were like, or how the tapeworm adopted their parasitic way of life, or back to the flatworms. There's not much definite information is available in regard to the evolutionary origin of flatworms. Just go on. Wherever you turn, you're going to find these kind of statements. What about crustaceans, which include crabs and lobsters? The phylogenetic origin of crustacea is lost in Precambrian antiquity. What about insects? There is, however, no fossil evidence bearing on the question of insect origin. The oldest known insects show no transitions from other arthropods. Or let's, let's talk about a fellow who studied a family of moths for a long time. Listen to his quotation. He said, when I began this study, I'd hoped to write a monographic treatise and explore the phylogeny, the evolutionary history of the family. But now I find that I know so much less than I thought I did and that the accumulated knowledge of others is so meager that any attempt along these lines would be vain and futile performance. I don't know which forms evolved from which or how, and we weren't there. And we may surmise, but the guess of one ignoramus is as good as the guess of another. And there's nothing to be gained by either. And he made that statement after he studied them for 25 years. What I'm trying to say is, there is not a living organism that you will study that you will not find quotations like this when it talks about its history is shrouded in mystery. We don't know. We don't know. Now going on, let's talk about Mollusca, including snails and, 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 and clams and squid. A great deal of discussion has been devoted to the origin of the mollusca. It is sufficient to say here that at present this question is unsettled. That's right. How about the vertebrates? As our present information stands, however, the gap remains unbridged, and the best place to start the evolution of the vertebrates is in the imagination. Or further, from another textbook, another authority, the reptiles. There is no direct proof from the fossil record, but we can readily hypothesize the conditions under which it, that is the origin of rep reptiles, came about. We can hypothesize about it, but we don't have the proof. What are the evidence? You can guess about it. What about fish? The geological record has so far provided no evidence as to the origin of fishes. We don't know. What about mammals? The first successful true mammals were small insectivore types whose relationship to these reptiles is not at all clear. Or the marsupials, pouched animals. Their origin is extremely ancient and its sources are not known. What are we talking about here? I don't care what you study about. I don't care what organism you want to talk about. You're going to find these kind of quotations. The real origin of horses is unknown. Or the primates, which is supposed to include the lemurs and the monkeys and apes and men. When and where the first primates made their appearance is also conjectural. It is clear then that the earliest primates are not yet known. And what about man? There is still no general agreement as to where true homo sapiens, the men of our own species, developed. Each authority has his own theory for which he will fight like a mother for a child. What we're saying here, this is what I call my general argument against the general theory of evolution. That number one, it's based upon seven assumptions which have never been proven. And secondly, when you descend into the details and look at any organism that you want to look at, you're going to find quotation after quotation and text after text which says, we don't know. Now then, finally, in conclusion, everything. Look at this statement here by Earl Core, chairman of the Department of Biology, West Virginia University. 
we do not actually know the phylogenetic history of any group of plants and animals since it lies in the undecipherable past. Now why did I go through all that? And I just took a sampling. There are hundreds that could be put up here. Because I want to ask this question. How do all these question marks that reflect the uncertainty about how we can trace out the background, the origin, the history, the family of all of these things, how do all those question marks add up to the exclamation mark, evolution is proven? When I used to teach in college, I gave a lot of examinations. That's the thing that makes you really unpopular. But suppose I gave an examination in which I asked 81 questions and the students didn't get any of them and they passed. It'd be absurd. What we're saying tonight is that the general theory of evolution has not been proven. It's based upon assumptions which have never been proven. And when you look at, at all of the animals that are discussed or to be discussed, you find out that shrouded in mystery, uncertain, we cannot trace this out. How then can people say that it's been proven? That's what I call my general argument with regard to the theory of evolution. But I feel also that I'm obligated to descend into details. And that's going to be, in the rest of the session, I'm going to be dealing with specific arguments they make. And what I want to show you about how we're going to do that. I want to show you the approach that we make in dealing specifically with the arguments that the evolutionists attempt to make. You know, it's interesting that many people think that because you come up with an explanation for how something might have happened, that if you can explain how something might have happened, that, well, it happened that way. While we all know, though, in common everyday affairs, that isn't true. For instance, in order to, for a theory to be established and accepted widely, two things must take place. Number one, new data and or experiments, your experiments and your observations must confirm the applicability of the one hypothesis. You've got to explain the data that you have by the theory that you form. You can't have a bunch of loose ends hanging out here. You've got to explain it. But the second thing that's important is this. Not only must you explain it, but you have to exclude an alternative explanation. The big argument in the 19th century was not evolution as much as the nature of light, and it remains a mystery to this day. That light sometimes behaves like a particle, sometimes it behaves like a wave, and we have not been able by experiments to eliminate one of the other explanations. Now, a lot of people think that because the theory of evolution can tell you about how a certain thing could have developed and they can hypothesize about it, make it sound all very reasonable, that, well, it happened. No. In order for a theory to stand and be stable and be accepted, you must not only be able to explain it with your theory, you must eliminate alternative explanations. Let me give you an example of what I mean by that. If I were to walk in the room tonight and I had a black eye, now, I have never had a black eye. I don't know how I escaped. I did have at one time a black circle in my forehead. You see, you learn a lot of things when you have children. You learn not to put one of those little suction toys that they put on the high chair on your forehead. I had this round circle on my forehead. I got all of the comments you could imagine about the mark of the beast. But suppose I came in here tonight and had a black eye. And you looked at me and I said, oh... Hey, I feel embarrassed because I was looking the other way and I walked right into a door. But someone else said, I know you and your wife and I've heard some of your arguments and what happened is you went too far and she hauled off and cocked you, hit you a good one in the eye. Will both of those explanations account for the black eye? Yes. Which one is the truth? Or if you've ever watched the Perry Mason shows on television, it's a form of the show. A crime is committed. The police department gathers the evidence at the scene of the crime and presents it to the prosecuting attorney who says that the best interpretation of this evidence is that Perry's client is guilty. He ought to be put on trial. So in the course of the trial, Perry Mason doesn't try to say that the evidence isn't there. He doesn't argue against the evidence. What Perry Mason does is he says that the prosecution's interpretation of the evidence 
is not the correct one. In fact, he says the correct one points away from his client to somebody else, and right before the commercial, they jump up in the courtroom and say, I did it. The point of the matter is that as we're studying the matter of evolution and special creation and asking you to look at the evidence, the real issue in this is not evidence, it is interpretation of evidence. And what the, what the creationist feels obligated to do is that he goes into the arena where evidence is presented and discusses that evidence and shows that we are not compelled to accept the evolutionary interpretation of evidence. And we present and feel that it's necessary that we present the creationist interpretation of the evidence and ask the people who listen, the people who study, the jury, to decide which makes the most sense. And that's the reason why we have to deal with the sciences. We're involved in the sciences, and that's what scientific creationism means, that using the evidences that have been derived from the studies that have been made in the sciences, that the best explanation of that material is the concept of special creation, not the idea of the evolutionary theory. And so we generally talk about six different areas. And let me illustrate what I mean by what we talk about when we talk about six different areas. For instance, comparative morphology and physiology. And what we would do, we would look at statements like this that you can find in textbooks. For instance, here's the evidence that we're looking at. All animals are alike in being composed of protoplasm organized as cells. Or we find that the larger groups of animals, although variously unlike in appearance, have similar organ systems for digestion, excretion, and other necessary functions. The point is, is it a fact that living things are in many ways alike? They are different. Men are different than the lower animals, but in many ways are men like all other living things? Yes, protoplasm composed of cells. There is that alikeness. So the question we're posing here is what's the best explanation of the evidence? We're not here to argue over the evidence, but the interpretation of the evidence. And the point that the creationist makes is that if we can give a reasonable alternative explanation of the evidence or show that we're not compelled to accept the evolutionary interpretation of the evidence, when the evolutionist says we've proven our case, he hasn't proven it at all. Now let me illustrate what I mean when the idea of, of, of things being alike. Now for instance, sometimes, and this is not the best picture in the world, but this is supposed to be the skeletal system of man and of a horse. And the, obviously they're displayed that way in a museum to make that comparison between the two. But let's just ask the question, are living things very much alike? Yes, they are in many ways, and there's a reason for this. Now the evolutionist says that the reason why living things are alike is that one evolved from the other, and that's the only explanation. The response that the creationist gives to that, not so. That in view of what we call the web of life in the food chain, there's a very good reason for living things to be very, very much alike. For instance, if tomorrow morning for breakfast I get up and I eat an egg and some bacon and some toast and some coffee, the question might well be raised, how is it that I can take something that came out of a chicken and something that came out of a pig and put it in me? And the reason I can do that is because I can utilize the amino acids that are in those things in me because we're fundamentally very much alike. There's one genetic code in all living things. And the creationist points to the idea that this would show the plan of an all-wise creator. We're not compelled scientifically. There's nothing overwhelming about any kind of an explanation that says the only way to explain a likeness in living things is the idea that they evolve one from another. Now that's a taste of what's going to come, previews of coming attractions. That's just a sampling of what we're going to do in the rest of this study in the other two lessons when we're talking about examining specifically the arguments that the evolutionists raise. Those arguments, again, have to do with vestigial organs, the idea that there are organs in the human body that apparently have no function, and the idea of genetics, how that slight variations take place between generations. My children are slightly different than I am, and if you get enough of these slight variations together over a long enough period of time, why well, you have the stuff of which evolution can be made. Or we'll go to the rock record, which is really the only direct evidence that can be offered for the concept of evolution, really. We'll be examining that, and we're talking about fossil men and the age of the earth. But the point I want to make is this. The issue is not over evidence. We're going to look at evidence in every one of those fields, and we're going to show that that evidence is interpreted then 
by the evolutionary theory and show you that the creationists will take the same evidence and show that we're not compelled to the conclusion that the evolutionists want to draw. Which means, I hope, that it'll be seen that we are wrestling with the evidence, with the real world. We're not trying to blind our eyes to it. And we're showing that the best explanation of it all is the concept of special creation. But the last thing that I want to do tonight is to raise the question and try to answer it. Why can't we harmonize the theory of evolution with the Bible? Isn't it possible? Many people feel very comfortable with the concept of uh, theistic evolution. And that is simply this, that God did it and evolution is how he did it. And I want to show you reasons why you cannot harmonize the Bible and theistic evolution or that the general theory of evolution cannot be harmonized with the Bible. Now, if you know your Bible and you know the general theory of evolution, you know they cannot be harmonized. I remember having a discussion of this very topic with the head of the biology department at Arkansas State University. And we had an interesting time. But how do you settle that? Well, you go to what the Bible says and you go to what the theory of evolution says. And the point I want to show is that you cannot harmonize them. Number one, theistic evolutionists say that they believe both the Bible and what evolutionary geologists say. But notice this. Evolutionary geologists say that the earth waters gradually came out of the interior of the earth during a very long epoch. But Genesis 1, 2 declares that the earth was covered with water right from the beginning. They cannot be harmonized. Number two, evolutionary geologists say that life began accidentally in a very ancient primeval ocean. And that's one of the questions I brought up when I was talking with this head of the biology department. I said, where did life begin? He said, well, John, both the Bible and evolution say the same thing. They begin, you see, in the ocean and water. And I said, that's not what it says. And we went to the Bible. Life did not begin in the ocean according to what the Bible says. Notice carefully, they claim that first life was merely minute bits of matter consisting of complex chemicals that somehow came alive. This concept of the beginning of marine life contradicts what the Bible says about marine life at the beginning. Genesis 1, 20 and 21 says that God created great abundance of marine life at the very beginning of marine life. Furthermore, Evolutionary geologists contradict what the Bible says relative to the place where the first life was. They say the first life came uh, in the ocean, but in Genesis 1, 10, and 11, the first life began on dry land. The two cannot be harmonized. The third, evolutionary geologists teach that fish and other marine forms uh, evolved long before there were any fruit trees. However, Genesis chapter 1, 10, 11, 20, and 21 contradicts this order of development. Fruit trees were created before the fish and other living creatures. If you know both of these, you'll know that they cannot be fit together. To believe theistic evolution, one has to believe that God's scheme of bringing life forms into being involved the gradual development of many forms of fishes over long periods of time and that fishes evolved hundreds of millions of years, according to the evolutionary theory, before birds developed. However, Genesis 1.21 declares that birds and fishes were created at the same time. One cannot believe theistic evolution and the Bible. Those who believe theistic evolution have believed that God brought forms into being through slow evolutionary development, beginning with small, simple life forms like trilobites and then larger marine organisms, then amphibians and mammals and finally whales. However, one cannot believe this. The first animal which God created were great whales, Genesis 1 and verse 21. Very interesting contradiction between what people claim and what the Bible says, theistic evolution. If you believe that, you have to believe that God brought all organisms into being very gradually through slow evolutionary process from a common ancestor. However, one cannot believe this, and also the Bible, because the Bible stresses ten times that God created entities that were to reproduce after their kind. Furthermore, to believe theistic evolution, one has to believe that God formed man gradually through various animal stages, but the Bible says that God made man in his own image and formed his body out of the dust of the ground. Furthermore, the Bible says that plants were created on the third day and insects on the sixth day. If the days were ages, as many people want to claim, then how did the plant survive several ages without insects being engaged in pollination processes? The ninth point, the Bible says that at the conclusion of each day that God saw that it was good. But according to the evolutionary theory, if you take the days and stretch them out into e e eons and epochs, they were periods filled with de devastation and death. And how can we harmonize that with the concept that it was good? As we come to the conclusion of these ten points that we're making, let it be noted that theistic evolutionists say the day in Genesis chapter 1 means an epic of long time. We're going to talk about that in the final night as we talk about the age of the earth. But the principal point to be made that whenever this Hebrew word is used and used with a numeral, 
In other instances, it refers to the day as we know, the ordinary day, the solar day. We'll be talking about this and a number of other things, but these ten points show us that if you know the theory of evolution and you know what the Bible says, the two cannot be harmonized together. The points that we've tried to make tonight in review are this. We've tried to remind you that we're not talking about slow, gradual changes just within a little group of, of, of living things, but we're talking about slow, gradual changes which are claimed to account for all the variations in the world of living things, one developing into another. We're not tonight uh, quarreling at all with facts, the evidence and facts that we can discover from the sciences. We're quarreling with interpretations of that evidence. Furthermore, we've shown that there are seven assumptions upon which the theory of evolution is based which have never been proven. And then we've tried to show you that if you'll look at any living organism, you'll find that there are textbooks and authorities that tell you we do not know how that developed. The point that we're making is if you put that all together, how dare anyone say that evolution has been absolutely proven? We will continue a careful examination of particular areas of proof that are argued by evolutionists in the further lessons. I thank you so much for listening to me in this lesson tonight.